So um, if you have not if you have not figured it out today, we're going to have a stewardship sermon. So um, everybody, well, in my experience, almost everybody uh, dislikes stewardship sermons. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, a lot of people perceive a stewardship sermon to be code for fundraising. And uh, the problem with that is it's, it's really not. It's, uh, it's not supposed to be, at least, I should say. Um, uh, it's um, it, it, the, 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 the idea of stewardship is that everything we have comes from God, and we are its stewards. We are its managers, that, that God has given us a portfolio of things, and it includes our money, um, our property, you know, the, the car, the TV, the, the house we live in. All those things are gifts from God, and we're in charge of them, not as owners, but as managers. So that's the, that's the idea of stewardship. So this idea that God has given us that, but not just, not just physical, you know, tangible things, but also um, our, our life, our, our life story, you know, our experiences, our upbringing, our education, our, our job history, um, you know, the mistakes we made, the, the good things we've done, all of that is a gift from God um, to, uh, for us to, to use for the, the glory of God as God's stewards. E- even the number of breaths remaining to you, that is, that is the big idea of stewardship, is everything we have is a gift from God, and we manage it as a portfolio for God. So, so that, is, that is one of the problems, uh, that people don't like to be reminded of that. They like to think, you know, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, or I inherited it all because we're such, uh, you know, <laughs> we're the king of England or whatever. Um, you know, and, and we, we deserve it. Um, but but that's, not, that's not what the idea of stewardship says. But... But there's a, there's a deeper problem with it, which is this idea that somehow God has um, a need, that, that, that God needs something back from us or, or something from us, that we have something God needs, uh, or that he's, he's sorry he gave us and he wants back. So, so there, is, there is an error there because Christians believe that God actually longs to give us things, that, that God has provided us all kinds of things and uh, wants to give us even more. So, so one of the things God wants to give us is a clean slate. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all of our sins, so we have a clean slate with God. That's one of the things God gives us, and God wants to give it to everyone. Um, God gives us a new life, a spirit-filled life in this age, and eternal life in the age to come. So God wants to give us new life. God wants to give us a new name. He wants to adopt us into the family of the children of God. And and then on top of that, God wants to give us the, the necessities of life and, and more because God wants to, to enable us to be generous with what we have. So not just our bare necessities, but enough that we can then be generous. God wants to give us all these things. It's not that we have something that God needs. It's that God actually wants to give us things. So that is, that is kind of the big idea of the gospel and, uh, it, it, and the way that stewardship fits into it. So... so why do we even have stewardship sermons? If, if those two things are true, why do we have stewardship sermons? Why, why do we even talk about stewardship? If it's, everything is coming from God, why do we talk about it? And the answer is because we want to know how to do it well. How, you know, if, you, if you are shopping around for a bank, you want to know which one pays the better interest rate, right? That's the same idea. God, God gives us stuff so that we can manage it well. So we talk about stewardship so that we can do it well. Now, how do we do that? If God has everything, he's not looking for a higher interest rate. He's not looking for return on investment. So what is it that makes stewardship good in God's sight? I think a lot of people would answer, you know, back to a corner, they might answer to be thankful. And that is almost right. But I wanna, I wanna use the readings today to, to illustrate it's not quite right or it's, it's only partly right. So, um, so we're going to be looking at this, these readings. So this is um, uh, from Mark's uh, Gospel. We've jumped ahead over the past uh, couple of weeks. Now we're at the end of chapter 12, and um, this is the end of Jesus' public ministry. He's gone from, you know, he's been traveling over the last several weeks. He's been traveling south to the Holy Land, uh, through the Holy Land, and now he's arrived in Jerusalem, and he's teaching in the temple. And in fact, this is the last public teaching Jesus has in Mark's uh, biography. After this, Jesus only teaches his disciples, and then there's the events of, of Holy Week when he's arrested and crucified. So, so this is the, the tail end. This is kind of the, the last thing for everybody 
who is a disciple of Christ to hear as a word from, from him. So uh, the way Mark writes his, his account. So here is Jesus. And Jesus says, um, as he's teaching, he says, watch out for the legal experts. So who are the legal experts? The legal experts, uh, they're kind of like me. They're people who went to school and learned about the Bible. But in the first century, they did a lot more. So they are, they're, they're called the scribes sometimes. So what, what they are is, if you imagine first century culture, uh, there's, there's no mass communications. And so if you want a Bible, somebody's got to write it out by hand. And they've got to write it out on papyrus or sheepskin. There's no factories that churn those things out. It's a very labor-intensive job to get a Bible. So there aren't many things that people can read. There aren't many copies of the Bible. And so most people are illiterate. They don't ever see anything to read. And so, so uh, most people don't have any, any ability to read. And so a few people, there's a, there's a group of people who actually, uh, they're identified. You know, they're growing up on the farm or whatever. And somebody says, that's a sharp little kid. He should, he should be trained as a, as a scribe or whatever. So, so they would be identified. And then they would be put under somebody else's tutelage. They'd learn how to read. And then they'd be given access to... The, the scrolls so that they could become experts in the law. And the reason for that was people needed somebody who would be kind of a walking Bible. They could say, hey, what are we supposed to do about you know, a goat stuck in a tree or something? And, and the person uh, in a bush. Um, um, so they could, they, could, they could consult an expert on what to do, what to do about particular things in the, in the Jewish law. So that was the idea. So Jesus doesn't say, Beware of them because you don't want to find out what's in the law. That's, you know, Jesus is perfectly happy if you know what's in the law. But, but he, says, he says there's a problem with them. And what is the problem? So verse um, 30, 30 um, where are we at? So he says, um, they like to walk around in long robes. They want to be greeted with honor in the marketplaces. So that's their problem. So they really like the trappings that come with their jobs. So long robes, you know, I think our, our mental image today is that anybody in the first century wore a long robe, but they didn't. They wore clothing that was suited to what they were doing. You know, if you're a, you know, cleaning out a stable or something, you wouldn't wear a long robe. A uh, long robe was formal wear, so you might, you, you might not own any because a lot of people were poor. But if you had it, you certainly didn't use it while you were on the job. And what he's saying is they like to be able to wear it all day long because they don't ever pick up a pitchfork or anything. So, so they like having this kind of soft job that where they don't have to do much and they want to be greeted with honor in the market. So um, this was something in the first century, uh, the, the person of lower status would greet the person of, second, uh, of higher status. And we know that because there was some rabbi back in the first century who did it the other way around and people commented on it. It's like, you know, here's this weirdo who's breaking the rules. And he would greet people of lower status first. And so, so most people did it the other way around. You'd meet you know, somebody who, who you had lesser status, and you'd say, good morning, doctor whoever, or professor whoever. And, and that was just the, the way that the society worked. And so Jesus is saying they like the trappings of their job. They, they like the fact that people pay them honor. They get to wear soft clothes all day long. And he says, they long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. And he says, that's their problem. Their problem is they have this sense of, of moral superiority. Or look how good I am. I've, I've got this great job because I'm so smart. I can actually read all these illiterates who keep coming to me with questions. I'm so much better than them. They have this sense of entitlement, and it leads to this, this kind of smug moral superiority. And, and he says, that's the danger. Because when you have that perspective, you can start thinking that you deserve what's coming to you, whether or not it's coming to you. And so he says what, what they do, and, and I should point out, there's, there's ambiguity in the language. Jesus may be saying this about all, all scribes, uh, all legal experts, but um, the, the language can be read as um, the ones who do this. So it's either because they do this or the ones that do this. So, so maybe he's you know, saying there's a couple of good scribes or something, but he says this is, this is a moral hazard of the job. Everybody's going to respect you. You're going to be able to walk around looking so fine. The moral hazard is you start to think you deserve it. And that is a danger because once you think you deserve it, he says, they cheat widows out of their homes. And to show off, they say long prayers. So, so imagine I was 
a terrible person. Now, of course, I'm awesome. But imagine I was a terrible person, right? So what would I do to cover it up? I'd pray long prayers, right? And people would say, you know, this guy, you know, Pastor Luke ripped off my, my sister-in-law's aunt, um, you know, when she was vulnerable. But, but gosh, he prays such good prayers. He's, he quotes the Bible so well. He must be a great guy. Maybe my aunt just, or my sister-in-law's aunt got it wrong. And so, so he says that they're covering up to show off or to cover up what they're doing. They say these long prayers. Now, now Jesus says they're going to be judged most harshly. Why? Because widows in that society were particularly vulnerable. They didn't have anybody who would look out, out, look, look out for them. They didn't have anybody who could, who could take care of them. And so they, they were vulnerable. But, but more than that, the scribes, you know, anybody would say, well, that's not a nice thing to do, right? She had no protector. Why would you rip her off, right? But, um, but the scribes knew better than anybody else because they actually had the Bible. They had it, you know, half memorized and the rest they had access to scrolls. They could go look up. And all through the Hebrew scriptures, it says to take care of the widows and orphans. That, that this is something that is, that is close to God's heart. They knew more than anybody that they shouldn't do that. And so for them to to let their, their attitude of entitlement, this, this superiority that they, that they think they have and, and the, 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 what it allows, you know, what it means that they deserve to take over makes them at great risk of being judged more harshly than other people. So that's, that's the first story. The first story is, is um, a stewardship story because, because if you're a scribe, you were, you were probably born into the right family you might have been identified as somebody who was just picked out because you were really bright, but more than likely, you were born into a scribal family. Um, uh, you have no control over that. Uh, you have no control over your IQ or your ability to learn how to read. You have no I, 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 uh, uh, control over whether your society in the first century values reading, right? You know, maybe they're down, you know, they, they care about how well you can farm, but you would be born into a society that actually cared and wanted you to be available so that people could have the, the things that come from the reading. So, so they, have this, they have this job that is a gift, right? It is a gift, and it lets them walk around in long robes and, and be greeted respectfully, and it's nothing that they did that gives them that job. It is, it is the grace of God that they have that job. So they are stewards of this excellent situation, but they are seduced by it, into wanting more, into saying, well, I deserve all this and more because I'm so awesome. And then they start cheating widows out of their homes. So that's one type of stewardship. It's obviously, you know, in case you're curious, that's the wrong kind of stewardship. So then the story goes on, or, or Mark goes on. There's a second story here. So he says, Jesus sat across from the collection box for the temple treasury and observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. So, you know, no one's writing checks. Everybody's using coins. It's the only real money there is at that time. And so you can tell how much money they're throwing in. You don't have to be watching them closely, but you can hear how much jingling there is as these, they would have like these trumpet-shaped boxes. Um, when I heard about that, I thought about the ones you put the coin in and it spins around. But it was kind of that idea, but you throw it in. And so people could hear. People could hear how much clinking there was. And then one poor widow comes forward and she puts in two small copper coins worth a penny. And then um, in, in most translation, there's a little footnote that says, says something equally, equally useless. So, so the problem is we can't, there, there's no good way for us to compare how much money she's talking about. So the actual amount of the coin, one of those coins was worth somewhere between a 60th and a 100th of a day's wage. So you might think, Four or five minutes. How much money do you make in four or five minutes of work? You know, assuming you're not taking a break. <laughs> you know, assuming they're, the, the, you're on the clock, right? You're not making a lot of money. So, so there's not that, it's not that much. And, you know, we, we really can't compare because, you know, even if you had a stack of gold bars, you couldn't buy an airplane ticket, right? You couldn't buy, buy a TV set. You couldn't buy an aspirin. So, so... It's, it's impossible really to compare how much money she's offering. But the point is, it's the smallest coin there is, and she puts in two of them. And Jesus says, I assure you, 
This widow has put in more than everyone. Now, not only does Jesus say that, not only does he say something that makes no sense, but he says, it, uh, Mark tells us, he calls his disciples to him. So he calls us, he's, all right, you guys are kind of looking around, admiring the building or whatever, right? Come over here, right? Mark says this nine times in his gospel. So nine times Jesus calls his disciples over to him. And then he says, listen up. He says, I assure you. In you know, some of you older translations, it would say, verily I say unto you, right? That's, that's what Jesus, so listen up. He calls his disciples over to make sure they get the, the message. And then he says, listen up. And then he says, this poor widow has put in more than everyone who's been putting money in the treasury. So, why? How, how, you know, I mean, I know Roman numerals are hard to do, you know, mathematics in, but, but it's easy to tell two coins. The, the, the only thing worth less than those two coins is one of them. And it's, it's remarkable, the widow doesn't put in one. She doesn't say, you know, times are tight, you know, I need to hold on to this last one. She puts in, she puts in two coins and when she could have put in one. And Jesus says, that's good stewardship. It's good stewardship because she doesn't have a sense of entitlement. She doesn't have a sense that she deserves it. She, she, you know, I, I should at least keep one of these coins. She says, you know, no, I, I trust God. I, I, I trust what God has done for me and I, I trust that God will continue continue to, to take care of me in the future. That's stewardship. If the idea is that stewardship is management, managing what God has done, she's saying, this is how I can be a good steward. And Jesus says, exactly right. The one was a bad steward and the other is a good steward. So what do we do with this? Well, that's, that's the question. You know, it's not a question of do you give enough money to the church? It's not a question of whether the church has great need. The question is, what is your attitude toward the things that God has given you? Your, your, your money, your property, the, the experiences of your life? Is it, is it one of entitlement, I deserve this? You know, I worked hard, I, I you know, really deserve this? Or is it one that, that it's like, hey, God gave me this, I'm gonna give some, I'm, I'm gonna make my offering because I can. Which, which is your attitude? You have, do you have the attitude of the scribes? Because Jesus says that actually leads to, to greater sin. But, but is that your attitude? Because Jesus says that's bad stewardship. Jesus says the attitude of the, of the widow is good stewardship. So the question is, what, what is your attitude? Years ago, back when I worked in the, in the uh, computer industry, I had a boss from Texas, and he had this weird verbal, verbal tick. Um, he would say, um, instead of saying I didn't know something, he would say, or, or that I do know something, he would say, I, I didn't appreciate that, or I did appreciate that. It was just an odd little, little thing, and it made him kind of stand out. But, but he, would say, he would say, I didn't appreciate that. And I think that is the essence of stewardship. It is to appreciate, not in the sense of being grateful, but in the sense of understanding, of actually having, having your mind wrapped around what it is that you have from God. That if you appreciate what God has done for you, then the gratitude will take care of itself. The, the decisions about how much to give and how much to hold on to, uh, how much to invest and how much to, to, to uh, blow, you know, those are, those are things that you will be able to make better decisions if you have the right attitude, if you appreciate what God has done for you. So, so what, is, what is your attitude? Are you more like the scribes or are you more like the widow? And, and more to the point, not just, you know, I can tell you my attitude is this or that, but what is the evidence that that's my attitude? What's my behavior? How does it illustrate what my attitude is? I think the, one, of the, one of the worst things about churches is that we can be, we can be very nervous about money. That we, we, we become anxious about, about the the things that God has entrusted us to, instead of saying what God has given us is enough to do the work he's called us to do. And I think one of the things churches can do is to be more, more, uh, or more unanxious, less anxious about what God has given us because we, we can illustrate by that 
that we trust that God will give us what we need to do what he's called us to do. We can illustrate what good stewardship looks like. So I'm, I'm grateful that the two churches that I serve are, are broadly um, not anxious about money. Um, you know, we have, we have work to do and, and sometimes the money that God gives us is in your wallets to start, but, but we're not anxious about the money and that, that makes me think that we're on the right track. But I encourage you in your own lives, don't be anxious about money because you're only a steward and your only concern is how do I do this well? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the things of this world, the money, the, the property, all these things are passing away um, and that you have called us to use them as tools. So help us to appreciate everything you've given us, whether it's a particular skill like the scribes or a small, modest amount of money like the widow and help us to appreciate that it is from you so that we can be better stewards of it. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen.